We're so lucky today to have my old friend, I think I can call you a friend, Mr. Roy H. Wagner, ASC. He's a very, very renowned uh, director of photography. I think it's fair to say mostly in the television realm, realm mm -hmm. uh, narrative. I know you've done some features as well, but uh, um, some really groundbreaking shows like uh, Quantum Leap. You probably don't remember, but I first actually met you doing a behind the scenes documentary about Quantum Leap. I was a documentary cameraman, and you came in and you were asking about what kind of lighting I was going to use. That made me a little nervous, sorry. <laughs> but uh, more recently, um, House MD, um, CSI, Party of Five, elementary. CSI, Elementary, Ray Donovan. and now Ray Donovan. So uh, he continues to stay really busy, uh, uh, been nominated for um, Emmy Awards, uh, won the ASC Award for... Two, two Emmys. Two Emmys, yes. Yeah. <laughs> for Beauty and the Beast pilot and Quantum Leap pilot. So, but he doesn't come from Hollywood royalty. No. He came from the Midwest. And how does a kid from the Midwest become one of the top cameramen in the business? I, uh, I started making phone calls when I was about nine years old to uh, Hollywood cameramen, uh, not knowing how much it cost my father to make those calls from the Midwest in the 1950s. And uh, fortunately, th they were so charmed that, that somebody would, would know who they were and wanted to talk to them that, that uh, they, they took my calls and listened to all my stupid uh, questions and uh, uh, were kind to me. And uh, one of them was stupid enough to say, hey, if you ever get to Hollywood, look me up. And um, I did. I, in fact, well, actually, he came uh, to uh, the Midwest before I got to Hollywood. It was Harry Stradling. It was on, I think, the first movie set I was ever on was uh, Facing the Crowd uh, uh, in the Midwest. And John Ford, The Horse Soldiers, and uh, uh, a number of different films. And it was just, it was like going, it was like a big, colorful carnival, going to the circus especially for, for a kid who's all of his family were farmers or, or um, normal people. So to, to be able to uh, see these people uh, natally dressed and acting as if they were all gods, and in many ways they were gods in their time. And uh, 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 so I just learned to honor my elders uh, and uh, and they, in turn, decided, well, this kid's uh, no threat to us, so we're going to try to help him. And so they, in, in turn, um, would teach me and, and uh, put up with me, come out to the set and watch what I was doing and, and kind of guide me. And when, when Harry, before Harry passed away, introduced me to Bob Gottschalk and said, uh, make sure that you take care of him. Uh, and founder so of Panavision. Founder of Panavision and, and uh, Denny Claremont. I, I, so to be vested by the old men was quite, quite an extraordinary thing. And, and uh, so over, over a period of time and 13 years of trying to get into the union, and in those days, you, you, they get, let you have 29 days. And, and Ron, you probably remember uh, it, I, on Hello Dolly, I get my 29th day. And uh, the head of the union would come out and say, Mr. Wagner, it's so nice to see you. And I think, well, it's awfully nice of him to come out and say hello. But what he was trying to tell me was, this is your last day. You're not going to get your 30th day. So 13 years of struggling, uh, doing every kind of non-union horror film. I did Ed Wood's last three-day movie. Um, I did, uh, Dean Cundy and I did, we would buy over beach party movies or horror films. I did Nightmare on Elm Street, he did Halloween. I did Nightmare 3. And, uh, um, and industrials and whatever I could do and in the interim, being a projectionist uh, or being a reader at MGM and, and just trying to say someday, hopefully, will I ever make it? And uh, Finally, you know, I'm still this. I'm 72 years old. And I'm still trying to figure out if I ever made it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I it's um, it's a, being a cinematographer is a challenging journey. Being in the film industry is a challenging journey, and I d I I think in many ways it's better today than it's ever been. 
But it's more complicated than it's ever been. I mean, everybody thinks that digital is easier. I frankly think it's harder uh, because there are, there are, there's less tolerance. I mean, it used to be when the F900 came out, you could just throw up a camera and throw up lights and shoot, and everybody said, wow, it looks like film, and they'd be happy. Um, but today, there's, there's so many specificities to um, the lenses, and uh, the lenses are not as important as they were with film. Uh, the sensors, the processors, uh, the light levels, I think it's extremely difficult to light at lower light levels than it was when we were lighting at 250 foot candles and you could actually see uh, the, the contrast ratio where today it's much more difficult to, to get that balance. And, and this is from a pioneer in shooting HD. You were one of the first people to shoot uh, narrative television with yeah, the Yeah, I did 900. the very first uh, narrative television show, Pasadena. John Alonzo and I were developing the cameras at Sony before they were called Cine Altas. And uh, um, uh, I wasn't trying to, to destroy film, uh, but I w always was interested in, in learning. I loved it, the idea of growing and, and learning something new. And I, I, uh, I, I think this is not a compliment to me. Uh, I, I've never known how to be inside the box. I, I've always been outside the box. It's, uh, um, I, I like doing things that are risky and dangerous and, and, uh, and freakish and uh, so somebody can come up with an idea and I, I, I wanna try it because I think it's fun. But I have to say that this era is the most difficult era for manufacturers I can conceivably imagine and why somebody would have the same passion I have and want to develop a, a, a piece of technology that has that is so demanding and it's so has so many requirements in relation to the, the lights we used to use, which were photometric dinosaurs in relation to what we're using today. Um, I mean, with the, uh, the uh, on elementary, we had an actor that we were using LED panels on that we were at like five foot candles and he said, the light's too bright, it's hurting my eyes. And little did we know at the time that, that the green spike was really, really affecting uh, their eyes and also the, the, the 450 uh, portion of the waveform which could blind people. Uh, we, we, were, we were literally inventing as we went along, but in truth, we, we were doing things that, that could ultimately affect people. But this was all done because the studios wanted to break the backs of, of Screen Actors Guild and the Writers Guild. And so they started promulgating this whole idea that digital was cheaper than film. Well, it was because the unions all had an electronic contract. They had a contract for news, sports, weather, uh, variety shows. Uh, where they they could convince a network to come in and have an IA contract or SAG or a Directors Guild contract was substantially cheaper than, than the, the, the television or feature contract. And now suddenly with electronic uh, technology, they could convince uh, the unions that they were going to pay that wage in relation to the film wage. And they broke the back of SAG. They broke the con uh, the the uh, the uh, uh, the negotiations with that. Uh, I was doing a project with uh, uh, Patrick Swayze. It was his last project, and uh, he lost his health benefits because he had to go with AFTRA instead of SAG. And uh, uh, but the studios didn't care. All they cared about was the fact that they were saving enormous amounts of money. And so virtually we, overnight. All yeah, everything narrative changed. television. And the funny went to thing digital. is, is that film had a hundred years to develop uh, its technology. Digital d developed its technology overnight and sort of backdoor. Everything was backdoored. Everything was like thinking that you were doing the right thing because we were all thinking of how can we match the look of film, but we weren't realizing that that we were that there were consequences to this, like. The things that were okay at 720 became a bigger problem when it became 1080p and 
even bigger problem when they became 2K and then bigger problem with 4K, 6K, and 8K. Uh, and uh, um, so the manufacturers have had this hideous ride to try to redevelop and, and uh, keep up with, 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 uh, uh, with the technology and also competing against uh, 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 manufacturers who are in other countries where they can manufacture the products cheaper uh, and with a so sort of an open source uh, world, they can, they can copy uh, someone who's spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on developing technology they can copy that for $100 or $1,000. So it's been a great adventure for me as an artist uh, to, to go through this. Um, but uh, uh, the, the truth is that what I find for most people is they think that because you're successful and, and or famous or something like that, it's just been an easy ride. And for every one of us here, we all have somewhat probably the same journey or every day are we going to make it is are we going to make it to tomorrow is we ever going to work again are we ever going to get uh, uh, are we ever going am I ever going to get to make that film I wanted to make or, or, or that kind of thing so we, we sort of were in the same boat but when I came to Hollywood you couldn't talk to the old men about that because they all had to act like they never had those consequences but today we are all surviving that and, and uh, hopefully um, a better community for, for being more connected. Well, we're so lucky that, um, that you share your experience. Uh, can you tell us about the new uh, web series that you're working on um, and where these people can find it? Years ago, I, I, uh, it really irritated me when I'd hear people say, oh, that." A cinematographer who a year ago was really hot, uh, oh, his work's out of vogue. It's out of vogue now. And I thought, well, how is that possible? He's still talented. He's still a talented person. Uh, and, and so I thought, wait, there's more to this. When, when you go to a museum, uh, do you go to the hip section of the museum? Or does every portion of that museum have its certain styles and you go to respect and honor that style. And when you look at a, a, a painting or a sculpture, do you go, gee, I wonder what brush they used? Or I wonder what kind of canvas they used? Or what kind of clay did they use for that sculpture? And I, for me, what meant more to me was, I wanted to know more about that person. I wanted to know how, why they took the journey they took. Some people took the journey of doing, for in film, three camera, some people took, took the, the journey of doing documentaries, some did features, some did television. And I, I thought that I'd be better informed if I knew more about why they made the choices they made, whether it was divorce or money problems or alcohol or, or they were just geniuses, uh, than where they put the light. I mean, there's only a certain number of places you can put the light and there's, uh, you know, it, whether lighting is good or bad is so subjective that uh, um, this is falling off. Um, that uh, uh, it, uh, to me, I wanted to know more about the person. So I was inter interviewing my grandmother. The Betamax had just come out, and I decided to interview my grandmother. And I thought I should be doing this to the old men. And uh, so I took. The my Betamax, and I started sitting down and just talking with them. And I set up 100 questions to ask. And what I wanted to see was how they answered that question differently, because each one of them would answer the question in a different way. And based upon that, I could kind of get it. I'd be informed as to who they were and why they made the choices they made. It was a great experience for me, uh, except I got to see what I would become uh, when I became old. Because some, the one Burnett Guffey, I interviewed him a day at, before he died. And, but you know, Burnett Guffey photographed Bonnie and Clyde and, and, and From Here to Eternity and films like that. But I interviewed him and, and Joseph Rettenberg, who was the, the king at MGM, George Folsey, and all these people. And I went to the ASC and the AFI, and I presented it to them. They said, what a great idea. 
and I was a nobody, so they took my idea and, and, and made it Visions of Light, which I did not participate in at all. But I had 100 hours of interviews uh, with Bill Clothier, who was John Ford's cameraman, and all these different cinematographers, and I was so frustrated by it. And about 12 years ago, Billy Fraker said, you really need to continue this. You gotta get over the fact that you got screwed. And uh, um, so I interviewed Billy, I interviewed Gordon Willis and uh, uh, Richard Moore, who was a co-creator of Panavision, and Richard Klein and Fred Konekamp. And it just sat there, nobody did anything with it. I went to all the different places. I went to Fox, who had put, uh, distributed Visions of Light. What a great idea, but nobody did anything about it. Finally, this young filmmaker says, I want to, I really want to pursue this, I want to do this further. And the seminars I've always done with people, I mean, demonstrations about where you put the light are good, but I think most people want to know how you survive. I mean, it, uh, I've been doing this for 50 years, I've survived. Did I do it well? No, if I did it well, I wouldn't be able to tell you how to survive. I, I didn't do any of it well. I, I was the worst example of anything. But uh, the truth is, I, so I said, okay, I, I'm, I'm in, into this, I, I'd like to, to do this. So the young filmmaker came up and started interviewing me. We've done over 50 hours of inter interview. But how I wanted this to be different was I wanted to interview other cinematographers, wanted to inter interview uh, uh, designers, actors, uh, uh, directors, uh, filmmakers, manufacturers, uh, and I wanted to kind of get a feel for who these people are. I mean, you you see a um, Mole Richardson light, but who's Larry Parker? Or then who's had a chance to sit and talk to Larry Parker for four hours? Or who's had a chance to sit and talk with Dana Weiger for for uh, four hours? Or or any of these people? And for me. That's what I really love. I, to me, I love all the technology. I love, love the advancements, how everything's getting better and better and better. But what brings me back to making films is the process. I love the collaborative relationships that you develop over years. I see some of you here I've known for 30, 40, 50 years. And, uh, uh, we don't work together every day. We don't, uh, sometimes we only see each other here. But there is a bond that is so deeply connected that I think it's what makes filmmaking such a uniquely wonderful journey is that, that we kind of all do this together. And uh, uh, you know, I'm here at 72 years old and I'm still having the time of my life. It's fun, it's fun to, put a light someplace, and, and it, as Billy Fraker used to say, you turn one light on and it, it's suddenly magic. It's, and the, the, the only reality is that what's inside that frame. Everything else is chaos, but what's inside that frame is, is reality. And we all get to do that. And we all get to do it because of some of these crazy people that spend <laughs> every dime that they have to develop some, some product to make our lives better. So. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here, and I'm just here to, to try to be the cheerleader for not the movie business, because it's an ugly, dirty business. <laughs> but, but for us, who have decided to make this journey, because we, we love the process, because we love the adventure of never knowing if what you, you do tomorrow is going to be the best thing or the worst thing you've ever done in your life. Now where can they find these interviews? Online, what's it called? Uh, uh, it's called Beyond the Darkness. Beyond the Darkness. And uh, I think uh, it's called Video Village Pro is the website. And it, it's a su subscription. It's, it, I think it's $75 a year or something like that, which is, I think, ridiculously cheap. Uh, but, uh, you know, they have to make, they have to have some way of making money to, to, to make it. Uh, and, uh, um, and so far, What's, on, what's up right now is David Mullen. I interviewed David Mullen for about four hours and uh, interviewed uh, uh, a lens designer. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we, I had 
four hour interview with a colorist defining what is a LUT, is it a good thing, are LUTs good things, are they bad things, and uh, how do you start the process, and how does a, a cinematographer communicate with a colorist, and what should we expect from you, and what do you expect from us, and, and you know, it's sort of like a simplistic, uh, and then he was very complicated, he was very technically oriented, and it got very exciting. <laughs> and he, and um, it was fun for me because I got to talk about things that if I was paying $350 or $450 a, an hour, I, uh, the studio would have, would have yanked me out of the room. Yeah. But because, because I was able to interview him, it was, it was great fun because I got to learn things. Can we do a little bit of a lighting demo? Sure. I, you know, you, you have uh, uh, different skin tones uh, yep. uh, uh, of two different people. I have to explain... I have never thought that lighting uh, a, a black person was, was difficult. I did a movie called Drop Zone with Wesley Snipes and Yancey Butler. Yancey had the fairest complexion that you can imagine, and, and uh, uh, Wesley Snipes had a complexion that was like Yafet Koto. And I, I never did anything to try to give him more light and her less light. I used the zone system, uh, and it was, to me it was all about exposure. Where do you place the, the exposure? Because if it's all within a range from black to white, you should be able to find an exposure that will allow you to capture both of those. And especially if you ha know the power that you have in the dark room in post-production, which you know, I, I, uh, for a year I was Ansel Adams' assistant, and and. Um, he, he always said that you create the image in the dark room. And so for us now, when I started out, he used to say you're not a photographer because you can't control the image. But today, we, have, we can control every pixel in the dark room. And so if we have that much power, then if we, get, we, if we capture everything onto the device, then we have complete power in the dark room to, to control and balance everything. So I don't think the image is completely created in, in, that, in that capture device. All I look for in a camera is a box. I don't want something that's uh, got a lot of knobs on it and toys on it. I just want something that's a box. I want a, a, something that, that will do a repeatable event, just like I want a light that does a repeatable event. I want a light that's going to be the same tomorrow. It's not, I'm not going to have to come back in and, and find, oh, that light, I have to, in the early HMIs, we used to have to go in and, oh, you can't use that HMI, it's too, has a green spike in it, you, have to, you can't use it. So I want something that's a, just a box, a repeatable event, a sophisticated repeatable event. So before we start, that, that's, to me, the, the, what's critical about uh, 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 lighting uh, uh, different balances. And... There are tricks that you can use that you don't even, there are times when if, if you have a, a person, an, uh, an African American who is, uh, is very dark uh, and you're concerned, don't light them at all, light behind them. Light the wall behind them and allow the audience to listen to what they're saying. There's a, there's a lot of power in, in a subjective interpretation of, of how you light people. You don't have to have everybody at the same foot candle level or the same key. So, enough. <laughs> uh, Roy H. Wagner, ASC, is uh, nice enough to uh, do a little demo for us. He's asked for uh, two Mole Richardson uh, juniors. One is digital and the one is traditional. So they're both balanced for tungsten light. We've switched our uh, uh, stage lighting around to be tungsten and take it away, Mr. Wagner. One thing that, I, that I've always been a hard light cameraman. I've been and I always used to, I, it was a derogatory uh, word, you know, hard light, a phrase. And I, you know, oh yeah, Roy Wagner is a hard light photographer. And I couldn't figure out why that was such a bad thing. And you know, a gaffer of mine told me one time, well, you know, every light's a soft light at the right distance. And uh, um, so I started trying to figure out how to use, first of all, I memorized the Mo Richardson catalog, the, the spread and the distances and the, when I was very young. And uh, 
I, I realized there was one, one thing that, that when you look at old television shows or old features that are direct hard light, they're, they're 500 foot candles or 300 foot candles, there's a sharpness to it that is unnatural. And uh, uh, so one day uh, uh, Conrad Hall and I were talking about the incidence of light. Uh, and the ca you know that the, the no light directly hits you. The, uh, lights have a tendency of, of being an incidental uh, uh, thing. And so I, th I thought, well, wait a second. If I can use the reflector on a light and don't use the, the middle of the bulb, which is the focal point of that light, and if I can tip the light down 45 degrees, well, then that's more incidental. So if you... The light should be a bit higher, but if you if before you take it up, if you can tip it down 45 degrees. And if you can get an apple box or a, a ladder on that. So the challenge is we pulled in these uh, mole lights. There's no wire. There's no dimmer. Um, but and just this will stop, Mr. Wagner. I just begin to uh, uh, tip it up easy. Right, whoop, too much, go back down. What are you at, a, a four? Um, now, notice the difference here. I could put a double on her, uh, but what happens when she starts moving around? Uh, so let's just pan the light right a little bit. More, right there, whoop, too much, right there. So one light, no diffusion, no dimmer. Okay, makes now, it work. Here, uh, stop down to eleven on your camera. Tip the light straight up, please. Now see the difference in the quality of the light. Now I could sort of get there by filling, uh, filling it in, putting in some diffusion in. But if you could tip back down again, please, and go back to your. And pan the light, uh, you're at 2.8 there, aren't you? Four. Tip it down some more. Pan right, there you go. Now, the lights become softer transition. I, have, ha, I don't have to, I feel like a Vegematic today. <laughs> um, uh, um, I haven't had to use any fill light. And uh, th this is one of the issues with the, the, the cameras, the, the, especially the, the, the Panasonic's. And, some of these cameras, they work so well in low white level that it's actually harder to light because of the, the, the contrast ratio is so delicate that it, you have to bring in solids uh, you know, for a negative fill and things like that in order to get, get the balance. Whereas when you were working at 200 foot candles, it was much easier to, to do that for me than to do this. Uh, it's still not perfect for me, but but uh, if I panned uh, right just a little bit more, a little more, there you go. I mean, it's not the, uh, the prettiest uh, light I've ever done before, but if I put a cross, it, but I love this, what's happening in here. And uh, it, it's, to me, it's a, it's a, I haven't had to use a 216 or an opal or 250. And uh, not that I don't do that, I, I do do that. And sometimes I will bring a 216 in in front. Uh, tip it up. Tip the light up. Tip it down a little bit. And uh, do something like that. Where I, 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 let, I let some of the light uh, be direct. Thank you. Do you have it? Yeah. Uh, I let some of it be direct and some of it I, I, I allow to be soft if I want to uh, nuance it more. But he's just, you know, this is a, a journey that I've been on for 50 years and I'm still trying to figure out how to do it. Uh, but um, uh, in truth, I mean, they're both close to being properly lit. I mean, she's about a uh, three quarters of a stop over. Uh, but if I stop down to a five six,
There you go. Uh, I love the idea of saying, uh, James Wong Howe used to love, he used to pursue the idea of a single light to light a set. And I, this isn't elegant, but I think it's a, an exercise. You know, we're, we're not trying to do it perfectly lit, it's an exercise. And for me, um, this is how I do a lot of things. This is how I do a lot of, a lot of my, uh, uh, my shows. And I will uh, not use as much diffusion as I used to use it. I used to bounce into a, a, a foam core and then come back through an Opal or 250 or 216. And by the time that I was done, I had half of the set and the actors had no, no room. And so I've tried to, I've tried to become much more manageable and give the actors the floor and find other ways uh, to, to light a scene. And uh, it's, it's helped me a lot. Uh, I still love hard light. To me, the best light ever made was the arc light. The second best light ever made is the data light. Oh. And uh, um, to, to me, if you have a perfect box to start with, you can make it anything. If you if you have to if you have something that's sort of okay, then you you can maybe hopefully step it up to the plate for something that you really want. You have to get a d another unit. If you have a perfect instrument like a perfect lens or a perfect camera or a perfect light, then what you end up doing is you can make that any of those things anything. That's, and uh, so that's why for me I, I'm always interested in the perfect box. Did you want to try the? Uh LED version? Yes, we should okay. uh, we Let's should keep over. this as it is uh, okay. and pan that off after we get the uh, LED in right next to it. Most of the most of the locations in the sets that are built for us or that we go to are not built with us in mind. Uh, so there's no place to put the light perfectly. Uh, you know, the, uh, the perfect place to put the light is outside the wall. Well, years ago, um, I realized how much time I was wasting by having the grips pull walls. So I started, I started, uh, I, I had my uh, key grip get a four by four uh, front surface mirror. And uh, I thought if I put the camera right here at the wall, it's gonna be a 24 millimeter or a 30, at, at the most 32 millimeter to get everything. So. What's going to end up happening is it's not a good choice. Everything's compromised. The person's close in, closest to the camera is too close. The background's too far away. If I could, if I could only use a 50 millimeter, well, I could pull the wall. Nor I could put the front surface mirror up against the wall, point the camera into the mirror, and have him flip it in post, which freaked everybody out. When, when monitors first came out, I had to have the Panavision build switches on the monitors so they could flip the monitors. Uh, but then you can get the, a 50 millimeter and you've got the perfect lens. And well, now Dato is doing something with light where he's, he's discover doing the same. I got to learn this because uh, you know, getting, getting the light at the right focal point for usefulness uh, is, is a valuable thing, and, and he's doing that with his lights, something that I've been doing with the lens for years, and so I, I think that's a, a journey I, I can't wait to go on. Um, but uh, um, to answer your question, light should never be perfect. Uh, it should be, you, you fall into the right place in the wrong place. It, uh, it's all subjective and interpretive. If, if, if somebody walked up here and they were bleeding out too white. Well, that's a stupid mistake, uh, unless it's a, you know it's a psychological effect that you're doing. So I always try to find the right place for the light. I think the uh, the LED is ready to go. Okay, is it full flood? I have never liked the idea of stopping a light down. To me, if I have to stop the light down, that means I chose the wrong light. Um, it's just. That's just old school. I know that, you know, uh, beam spread on lights uh, can be very inconsistent. You can find shadows in the midst of a, 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 a beam. And to me, when you spot a light, you're just exaggerating a, a problem that 
that the, the lights photometrics has already. So I, I tend, I never like to spot a light because I, I, if, if I need more light, then I should have chosen a, a bigger unit. And if I have to move it in closer, then I'm either doing it for, as a compromise or because uh, I've chosen the wrong light. So um, let's see how this works. Uh, tip it down a little bit more, please. Pan right. And you're at a four? Okay. Okay. So can you look over camera uh, to, uh, to the light side, please? I'm seeing green spikes in, in here, which is it may be the monitor. Uh, but green is a, um, a serious issue with me with, uh, with uh, complexion. Uh, I, I'm sh sure all of you remember when HMI first came out and we would have a uh, light-complected blonde in a scene. And uh, we'd have what close up on one actor who wasn't and one actor who was. And we would have to compromise the timing of the entire scene to get the, get the green spike out of the HMI. Um, and uh, now we're having the same problems, I think, personally worse with, with uh, digital. Um, but uh, I don't think that that's the light. I think that's probably the monitor. So uh, let's uh, me remember what this looks like. I love, I love the skin tone. Uh, can we pan? Uh, turn the other one on and pan, pan that off. Uh, tip it back down, please. The tungsten light we want to tip down more. Uh, it, it'll feather it down a little bit. Tip it down. Right there. Okay. Did, what do you see? Do, do you see any differences in the LED and, and the, uh, the tungsten? <laughs> yeah, now, this is funny because I wanted to try this because it does seem more natural. But I'm from the school where we had DC tungsten. And DC was beautiful. It was, there was a quality because it was a square wave, uh, uh, elec electrical pulse was a square wave. You got a consistent uh, color temperature at all times, whereas with the, the AC tungsten, uh, it was constantly cycling. And so that it, it didn't, the, the purity of the bulb was not the same. And uh, uh, I just, I, it took me a long time to get used to the AC. We, we go on location uh, and we would plug in the house power. I, I always hated the way a tungsten light looked in, in AC. So uh, I contend that a DC tungsten light would be even prettier than this AC tungsten light. But you know, it's all subjective because we're dealing in a different realm now. No, nobody's using tungsten lights anymore. Very few people are. And uh, 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 so we just have to learn to use the tools the best way possible. So for me, what's critical is that I, I live with this stuff. I try to spend hours with a lens or with a camera or with a light and just continuously play with it to try to find out what are, its, what, what are the values or qualities of this light so I can know how to, to romance or dance with the toys that I have. Well, uh, we're sort of running out of time. But, uh, That's me. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm on the end of my journey. My job is to help everybody else to, fo to follow their dream. My dream was, was a, a, a tough road, and I hope to help anybody that needs or wants, wants to get some advice from somebody that made, made almost every mistake that is conceivable to make. Let's hear it for Roy H. Wagner, ASC. Thank you so much. Thanks.